welcome back to the Workforce Identity Developer Podcast. This week, I'm joined by Jeff Taylor, who's a Senior Product Manager on the SaaS Platform team here at Okta. It's a heck of a job title, Jeff. What does it mean? We deal a lot with just the overall developer concern. So a lot of my responsibilities, uh, first and foremost, are centered on what a team we call the developer community products. And this is just building tools like our management SDKs um, to make our developers successful in building with Okta. Another part of my role is actually working with the Okta integration network. And this is a deal with another class of developers that are our integrators looking to build solutions that can be used by all of our Okta customers. So as you can see, I spent a lot of my time in the technical arena, um, but also thinking about things like product and moving us forward. So success metrics and everything are driven based on how well our developers can build on, on Okta as a platform. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of that building that folks are doing is automation in some way. And I really like the way that you articulate the automation journey or almost loop. How do you describe that? Yeah, I really like the term journey. Um, when I was coming up, uh, the first clue I got into architecture was on the application continuum. Uh, I like classic movies. So this was how I learned how to live with a monolith, right? Um, so I do like I do like this concept of being able to transition in phases and to not look at your end state as like the ultimate like barrel toes of finish line goal. To be okay in the states that you're in and to recognize the signals and the catalyst with which to mature, right? And uh, in the application continuum, we move from monolith all the way to fully distributed microservices. And I've been applying this to other areas. And one of the great ways that we can apply this here to automation is knowing when you are doing things manually and ad hoc, and when's the right time to actually go into full-blown, full-scale automation? It's a journey. You take different stages. There's different tools that you can use to help you on that path. And it's okay to be in one state versus another. It's just going to be a determination of what's right with your people and your corporation and all of the things that go into discover like when you are ready to take that next step. But to understand to, first of all, be okay with where you are and know when is the right time to invest to move forward. So what are the steps that you'll often see an organization pass through on that journey? There's a couple of interesting forks in the road, but it really just starts out with like just the manual stuff, right? Yeah. In Okta terms, like this is using our admin UI. So making changes to your policies, changing users and working through any number of things that you could configure. Uh, when we start to put some regularity to those changes, we start to notice that there's opportunities for mistakes to happen or unintended consequences, right? Like we might do something and then realize that we've changed something unexpectedly in another area. It's probably a good signal that, that we may want to standardize. That's another big term here, standardize on how these changes are made. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to basically not not replace the human, but put the human in a different position to gain some more oversight, use them in a better way and not necessarily to just like rip and replace like that's that's far too abrupt. But sometimes our painful moments are times at which we can we can mature and change. Or other times are just when the frequency gets too large, and we need to scale quickly, right? We notice that we're having a lot of change requests coming in for a particular area, and it might be easier for one operator to do things if they have a button to push as opposed to a number of steps to complete. And so those are like two scenarios that you can use as real gauges as to when you should be looking to employ a more automated solution. Another thing that I've personally seen is when you start having the long checklist, that's a yeah. cue that you know what you're doing to a level of clarity where you can explain it to a machine in a way that it will do what you expected. Yeah, I think there's a key item in there is the, the, the repeatable tasks, right? Once the repeatable tasks are very well known, good opportunity to start automating. What does the end game there often look like for the organizations that you see that are automating identity stuff? Not to bring uh, too much prescription in here, but like we do see this with our advanced Terraform users where, and I think Terraform's a really good technology to really describe like the strength of automation because you can do pretty much anything with your infrastructure. So while, you know, I work for Okta, I think identity is super important in the whole corporate infrastructure. It is a small piece of a much larger ecosystem where you have machines, you have operating systems, you have networking, you have 
all sorts of peripherals and, and additional applications that are going into your ecosystem to help run your business and increase and stay and have productivity stay on a much a higher level. So it's important to understand that like in these advanced organizations that are employing large scale automation, they're running all of these aspects in concert. And usually there's a single thread of technology through that. And that's what Terraform provides. It's a way that I can orchestrate and automate just pretty much anything in my infrastructure, and including the identity to make sure that it's all done smoothly um, without manual intervention. So environments can be stood up and torn down very quickly. Um, if I like a couple of really great examples are if I need to add another environment, say I have a dev and a prod and I need, want to introduce a UAT to involve my customers to test pre-production material. Uh, Terraform is a great way to actually build that. The other thing is when I, I, I say we need to expand into like another region, we're talking about globalization. It's really hard to do that and also make sure that you have the right controls in place for actually crossing those thresholds into other sovereign nations. You want to make sure all of that is instrumented and written down, most importantly, right? Like that's what Terraform gives you. You can check all that in. So you can read through the setup as you would like any type of, of, of manual or any output of diagnostics before you create and then also check and make sure that's synchronized after creation. So there's a number of scenarios that you see as, uh, as companies going. I like to give these examples because you may or may not be in one of these situations where it might be good to start looking at something like this just to standardize and make sure everything stays sane as you look to increase your reach and improve your business. That auditability can be another huge um, clue or cue that you want a bit more automation. You want the automation to not only be doing the task, but also logging appropriately that it happened rather than trusting a human to uh, remember another step. That's um, a really good point um, to, to go into. And this one where you see this in the processes, right? Translating the, the, the verbal description of what's changing with the actual machine instructions of the change. Being able to match those things together is a very important concept, especially for auditability. It's not just like I don't people I don't want people to assume that this is about who made the the critical change that took the, the infrastructure down. No, this is really just about the visibility into how your environment is changing, right? And you can look at these modalities and, and what's been changing over time if you are recording this. And it also gives you these added protections as well. So you can make sure that the right people have access to run these things. And I think these are also good tangential benefits to building automation into your into your daily workflow and processes to help non-business users understand what's actually going or non-technical business users understand what's going on with the technology and the infrastructure that's being built. And that need for accessibility of knowledge about what's happening to an increasingly diverse group of backgrounds and group of knowledge bases as an organization grows ties into something that we sometimes talk about among ourselves. Um, we sometimes call it corporate maturity, where I think most listeners will have the intuition that the best tool when you're a tiny little startup is probably going to be different than the best tool for the same job when for a huge enterprise or for a government, just because they're under such different constraints and have such different risk profiles. Uh, how do you think about that maturity model? Yeah, I think there's a, a understanding kind of where you are, what industry you're sitting in, what are your guardrails and uh, for regulation and whatnot. Those are really important to understand what your next steps would be. If you're a traditional, like, you're just a startup, you're starting out and you're trying to like figure stuff out. Remember, like, that's why I love the application continuum. We want to be able to respond quickly. Like it also means that you might not have as congealed processes because you want to get changes out very quickly. So it's it's a little bit loosey goosey when you're when you're making these changes. But either the moment you have important customers, like you've landed your first enterprise customer or your first really large customer and that site goes down and you realize like, well, we've got to tighten things up because we can't really afford to have this happen so that we you know have these have these Mars on our um, on our reputation. So you want to level up, you know, and I think it, it really just, it depends. It's, it's a good way to pay attention to what's going on around you. I think another good thing is when you start to understand that data that you might be bringing in or housing might be more sensitive. So you want to make sure that changes are a little bit more rigorous or you're going for like, you're going into different areas where like you want to get into government. And so you want to get FedRAMP security. There's a lot of controls that you might have to implement 
some of that precipitates down into the technical world with things like uh, infrastructure as code. And so you want to be more responsive to your customers in those areas and be able to adjust quickly um, without years and years of toil to kind of get um, on that speed. So I think like there's a lot that goes in to that maturity. It has to deal with you know, your size. So how many people, I didn't even talk about this, how many people are touching the code once you get to a critical mass realize like I can't like I can't just like look over and say, you know, hey, hey, uh, hey Emily, like what are you doing here with with this piece of code? Like can we can we take a look at this together? You've got thousands of engineers or you've got hundreds of engineers across the globe. You need tighter controls over like who's checking in. So you need to use things like source control. All this stuff happens. So you've got your corporate complexity, like how, your size and your makeup and your distribution. You've also got your business areas. So the industries that you're replying to, you've got the data that you're looking to create or protect or assets that you're creating for your users. And also you've got your own scale. Like what does your footprint look like for your infrastructure? Sometimes that may outpace your, you know, building AI solutions that we have now. You need more compute power, right? You got to be able to scale very quickly. So that would change the complexity of your automated deployment. So there's all of these things that you're paying attention to. And I think the most concrete advice I could give is every once in a while, just take a step back, take a deep breath, like look at some of these axes, right? How many developers do I have accessing my infrastructure and my code? How many um, industries am I in? What kind of data am I providing and protecting for my users? And then what is what is my needs for compute um, on the back end? Those four axes can give you a good, clear idea, idea of when the right time to mature is. I even think it's like that complexion one is roped into your processes, your people, all of these things. So I think you, I think with that, you've got a good base to cover, and when you can, when you can start thinking more seriously yeah. about automation. And with automation, as with just development in general, you're thinking about looking for that sweet spot between speed and safety, where if you're just prototyping a brand new product, the worst thing that could happen might be that you take two years too long and someone else beats you to market and now you're not a company. Whereas if you're really established, like the worst thing that might happen might be a downtime or a breach at a really crucial moment. So the threat models, if you look at it from the pessimistic angle, change so much across the different scales. And one yeah. thing that I would throw in as well is that you kind of want to be mindful of the scale and the threat model, not only of your own business, but also of your customers, if you're selling software in any way, because that will inform what they're looking for and looking to buy. Absolutely. Totally. 100% agree. But automation, though, is going to let us sort of build this institutional memory of things that have happened in the past and get that blend of speed and safety. I really yeah. like that term of institutional memory, because all of this being codified is there, you know, for posterity, right? Like we look at like our GitHub logs, right? Like aside if you're doing like, you know, a, a force push and you're erasing history, all of like the, the crazy things that we've been through. But in general, right? Yes, like you you've got the full lineage, right? And I think that's one of the that's one of the holy grails that um that security actually looks to give is like, do we have a full chain of custody? Like from the time that a you know the code is actually written into the moment that it reaches production, do we have like clear insight into that whole journey? And like that's a that's a great way to build you know, the muscle for improvement, just as much as like you're building the muscle for like releasing, right? So you know exactly what you've done in the past. So you're not doomed to repeat, right? Like that's always what we, what we hope is that we're continually improving and not repeating the mistakes of the past. Yeah. And every new test that you add in your automation, every new consideration that you add is usually either because someone had the thing happen to them and says, I don't want that to happen again, or because someone foresaw the thing happening and said, well, I don't want that to happen at all or I do want this to always happen, or that worked really well, so let's have this happen again. In a way, it's sort of this encapsulation of what all of your colleagues have known, including your past self. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that anthropomorphization that we can do is fun, is helpful. Um, do you think that that ties into how we change our automation as we go on? Um, how we think about adding, removing tests and reasoning about what belongs in it? The testing is a really interesting one. So I, I'm a big believer in in test driving your development. I think it provides a lot of clarity between product and engineering to create changes in in code, which leads to safer 
you know, better, more resilient code in the in the long term. I've actually like in my past, I tried to explain explore like putting this into practice with uh, infrastructure as code modules. Like, right? can we do the same thing, building testing in with this that same same kind of outcome? And I and I do believe that it's possible. I know Terraform has this plan that we can run, and we can always introspect into the plan and see what is what is actually going on before it's actually being applied and built. And this becomes really important because when we're we're going and we're making like we're making production infrastructure, and sometimes we're making production infrastructure in places where price matters, right? Like maybe EC two or like Google Cloud compute, like Google, yeah, Google Cloud. Like, oh yeah, depending we, on when in history we are, yeah, price yeah. will matter much more yeah. or much less. <laughs> yeah, and like nobody wants to wake up in the morning with a huge bill for compute because they've over allocated, right? Like, um, that's a it's a real problem. So. You know, doing this, like running these tests and making sure that things are set up correctly um, or having ways that you can even extend your infrastructure as code to test and make sure that the compute numbers and everything, it's all very essential in making sure that your environment is exactly the way that you intended, right? Like, I think that's always good. And you have more flexibility. Like, this is one area where you would seem like if I'm just a person at a terminal trying to like create an instance. And like EC2, I can immediately get that feedback. But you can't do that at scale, right? Like, and that's that's the thing is like you might get that in a very, very small narrow box, but like having to horizontally scale that workflow, it's just not going to work. So your next best thing is to work with testing in the automation frameworks. And I think this is a great way to prove out the concepts, especially like if you want to add another environment, especially getting something closer to prod, you you know you're taking on more expense, but you always want to figure out if it's if it's worth what it's going to cost to get there. And I think these tools are what's, you know, these testing tools are the ways that we can actually evaluate that on an even playing field without having to expend so much cost. When you talk about scaling like that, moving it, shifting from I want a machine to I want the machines is sort of the backbone of automation. It turns your single action from a smaller scoped thing to a larger scoped action that takes you a similar amount of thought to decide to take, to decide it's the right time, a similar amount of work to execute, and yet it has so much more impact. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is like one of the things where we turn our like individual statements into superlative statements, not like like you just you said, like I want one machine to do, but like no, I want all the machines to be a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's that and that was something like in the in like the early 2000s and 2010s, like we were always looking for. It's like machines have to be like for like. And before this was at the cusp of cloud computing, like there wasn't really a great way to do this with like infrastructure on the ground. And there were not really great ways at that time with the uh, segments of EC2 instances, which the only thing available, like you could say, well, I want a large, like I want somewhere between a large and an extra large, but I don't really have a choice. So I'm going to have to pick one or the other. Now with all of the things being like, you know, more precise, like we're able to, to make these decisions at a much more heightened level. So I think it's just great to see that we can do, like we can make these statements like, I can assure that every machine is working identically in a large ecosystem. I can assure, like from Octa's perspective, I can assure that every organization I have has the same policies set up and the same grouping set up. So everyone's experience is standardized across wherever, wherever you are, whatever tenant you're in. So I do believe like that's a that's a really key thing that we can do to, you know, assure that we're able to continue scaling the business but we're not worried about slowing down the infrastructure to get there. So let's say that an Okta admin is currently just doing everything by hand. So the concrete case of this general automation journey that we've been talking about today, and how are they going to know that it's time to start thinking about automating some of what they're doing? Well, I do like the age of like, listen to your emotions. Um, obviously this is coming from products. So product, we're obviously very much into user empathy. But I do think that the the spark for innovation comes like it's born out of emotion. And sometimes it's negative emotion. Like, why am I doing the same thing over and over again? I really want to do this other shiny new thing that's really great that will help the company. But I'm stuck doing the same repetitive task over and over again. I think this is like this is the infomercial thing. There's got to be a better way. Well, <laughs> it goes you know, from get to to have to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So 
And I think like those using those existential moments where people are like, I got to find something else because I want to do this other thing. Great signals to explore. And when you start to explore, there's a couple of opportunities you have. Like one is using the API. It's the most tangible thing that's right in front of you. Um, I know like in the customer identity cloud, we've got a full blown CLI that allows you to explore all the objects and everything. That's a really great way to navigate your way, do both things. I think CLIs do a great job of this. Navigate in a headless experience through all of the objects and contained in an application or platform. And two, allow you to start putting those pieces together in like a, a scripting type format. Again, you can do this with the APIs, but it gets a little bit more complicated because you have to you know, deal with authorization and all that great stuff, but still possible. The point is, you know the steps, you start instrumenting the steps in a more deliberate and programmatic way through CLI or API. And then you just package those things together, either with Bash and you know the added instructions that you have from CLI, and maybe a Bash script that uses uh, a bunch of curl commands that can do a lot of these things right together. But you start putting those together. Now you've got like these scripts and you start putting these scripts to uses like maybe building them into your, your you know, an internal self-service tool or something like that. But then you get to the larger, and you're dealing with like user requests. Like I need to move to a group and like, okay, well, I can figure this out with approvals and whatnot. But when you start saying like, well, I got to like move a policy between uh, development and production, what's going to happen there? Then you need something that's a little bit better, right? Like you want to be able to get that into source control at that point, because you're talking about a change request. You want to be able to adhere to your change control process and move that along the with, with all the rigorous testing and whatnot and so now that's a good signal for you to start building something with like terraform or whatnot so you, you i think now now you've started to get like, like i think like in this question we're building concretely how i move from like i'm doing the same repetitive task over and over in the admin ui i'm exploring and learning and cobbling together the pieces through an api or an admin or sorry an admin cli and then now I've like, I'm into full blown, like doing everything with scripts, but now I need to actually start moving over the infrastructure, like the bare bones things that we need more oversight on. That's a good signal to use Terraform. Yeah. And I think you're also touching here on an important way that the learning curve is split between the different parts of itself. So the first time when you're like figuring out what API calls even need to be run, what even is happening under the hood in Okta there's part of it is you're learning your CLI or your SDK, whatever you're using. But another big part of that learning curve is you're just figuring out the language of what's happening in the identity provider. You're learning to describe what you want it to do. And so when you imagine how hard is it going to be to shift from, let's say, the API to the CLI switch or shift from the CLI to Terraform, something like that, or even potentially to shift from something that's lower code, like a workflow to something that's a bit higher code to give you a bit more customizability or integrate more tightly with something else, then it's not going to be quite as hard as you'd expect because you're not going to have to relearn that internal vocabulary. You'll go, oh, here's here's the outcome I want and here's how I can check through the console that it happened the way I thought it would. Yeah, and I think that's a great way to, to sort of summarize all of it. It's like, in the one hand, you spend you spend most of your time learning Okta, right? Like in that admin UI, you're learning Okta's like names and objects and object models and relationships. You're then applying Okta in real world scenarios in this next step with our SDKs, APIs, CLIs, all of that. Then next step is you're then you're saying I'm ready for the next thing, which I think is a real key differentiator because learning Terraform, Terraform is backed by the configuration language, the HashiCorp configuration language or HTL. So you're learning something a little different. It's based on Go. So if you don't even know Go, you're gonna start to learn Go and then start to learn this HTL. But there's a there's a there's a definite carrot at the end of that, which is like this full blown automation. And now I'm applying my learning of how to navigate Okta and its object model in conjunction with all of my other uh, ecosystem as well. So like now I'm putting that into place in the grandest scheme. So it's, you know, it's learn Okta, then learn Okta's object model with the intent to apply and make changes and then make those changes at scale with a, with a new platform. But each level of that builds, an, I, I would say like energy for the next layer of investment as you yeah. start to see benefits from it. And again, why I think the journey is so important, embrace the stage that you're at because you're learning all of this, 
there's no there's no rush again you, you're just paying attention to the signals that are coming in so you know when you're ready to jump and you're not leaping before you're you're ready yeah and more than just energy you're building skills you're building yes. skills that will apply to other use cases so you build the terraform skill and then you want to automate something else that also has a terraform provider it's going to be so much less hard than you thought it would be if you're comparing it to when you also had to learn the basics of Terraform. You want to build something else that uses an SDK in your language that you've been picking up. It's going to be that much easier because you're that much more familiar with the language. So I think making sure not to discount the reusability of the skills that you build through the automation journey is um, really important. Yeah, I think it's like a similar analogy is like, it's much easier to multiply if you understand addition mm -hmm. than it is to learn multiplication just right off the gate. So yep. I think like building on these skills allows you to take these natural extensions and really like level up. And I think the great thing that you put in there is, yes, you're learning skills, like everything that you acquire are skills and knowledge. And just as I mentioned that uh, multiplication analogy, shifting between Terraform providers is extending what you already know based on a very core common concept. So it's just then translating the knowledge of Terraform with someone else's object model and resources that are modeled in their provider. Yeah, and one thing that I personally really love about open source tools like Terraform, open standards like OIDC, is that skill is transferable. Any IDP that uses OIDC, is my OIDC knowledge is going to apply. Um, any organization that uses Terraform, the Terraform knowledge is going to apply. And so, it's an investment in that you get to keep as well as something that your team gets to keep and benefit from indefinitely for as long as the problems that you automated um, keep being addressed by your automation. Yeah, and I think it's like, you know, a, a little historical mm -hmm. note here, like we, Terraform, Terraform has been around for a while. It wasn't necessarily like the, it's been a very popular tool for a long time, but it wasn't necessarily the only tool. And I think um, the statement that you're making here just sort of lends testament to like where it's come over time and how it is more of a standard. Um, before it was an option and now it feels more like a standard for development. We hear this again from our customers a lot that they, they really love it. But it is important to call out that like even when you're still talking about infrastructure as code and managing infrastructure that like it's really, really important to understand that these skills do translate even to these other tool sets because a lot of the, a lot of, there's a lot of similarities there. So again, you're translating, it's the same way if I'm moving from um, maybe like uh, moving across like backend languages, right? Like there's a lot of syntactical knowledge, but like understanding how to build server side applications is still going to transfer to some extent. Um, so you're just, you're learning how to apply that in these different arenas. But I think like, again, doubling down on what you said, like building those skill sets, making those skills transferable. If you come into like a company that uses something different or like you need to move into low code. Um, so these principles will still apply and you can still apply them with a lot of success um, in these different areas. It's like how math is still going to be math, no matter what human language you've described a given concept in. And yeah. the final thing that I'd ask you about our example of someone who's automating the tasks that they're doing day to day in Okta is that as the adoption of their automation grows, uh, what challenges are they going to run into in terms of people being surprised by it or having all these demands of it? And how would you suggest that they handle this? Yeah, we're actually hearing about this in a little bit um, from customers that are looking to incorporate more automation. Like this is part of the journey. Like, we talked we talked a lot over the course of this podcast about like you know how to get started when you know the signals but you didn't really touch on is like where the rubber meets the road right like okay I'm I'm going to take a group and I'm going to have them automate all of their changes and I still have some I still have some users that are doing manual changes like what am I going to do here so um one of the things that we start to do is say like you can definitely experiment with automation but I think the most important thing to do is to incorporate automation in with your normal change process. So again, if you think about it, you've got two processes that might be competing for attention. Well, like you just need some uh, piece over top that can help normalize both, right? So like if you have something like a change advisory board or some change control system committee that meets regularly, like bring your automation changes to it along with those manual changes and work on that translation between the code to business or business to code 
bringing all of these diverse backgrounds in, in conjunction with those uh, manual changes. And that is a way that you can start like leveling the playing field. So you can start to move more of your manual changes to automation. Um, the other things you can do is like look at areas where you have maybe some frequency of change that's comfortable to you and lower risk of, of issues and start there as well, right? Like if you're changing, maybe, um, maybe like it's a, it's, you know, pre-prod pre -prod policies, let's say like you would, you, you know that there's going to be some impact, but it's localized to internal, but you want to make sure that all of those are going through automation. This is where you can work out a lot of those growing pains, right? So Making that first selection is a, is a really great way to step through this process and then also incorporating it in with your larger change management processes are some really tangible things to do to get started along this journey. We could do a whole other episode on the considerations around config drift and what to do about it, uh, which sounds like it'd be a lot of fun to do sometime. I do for think now. so. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, for now, I hope that gives you a taste of what you're looking at in the automation world lets you think, yeah, actually, that boring thing, that annoying thing, that darn checklist that I don't want to mess up, I should be making some system do that for me. So hop on into the comments and share your stories of automation. Tell us where you're at and what questions you have, and I'll hope to get those answered on future podcasts. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was great. <laughs>